This is American History TV's Lectures in History podcast. This week, a class on the U.S. military in the 1890s, taught by Weber State University professor Brandon Little. His lecture includes officer corps reform, a new focus on sea power, and an international incident with Chile. This is our final presentation for History 3280, and I'm titled it Shifting Horizons, 1890 to 92. And the subtitle, Beyond Wounded Knee, uh, should be familiar in one sense. We've discussed the ways in which that uh, engagement between American forces and the residents of the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation along Wounded Knee Creek uh, were engaged in, in, in events uh, specific to the age uh, that resonate uh, far beyond uh, in the spirit of, of uh, the oppression of, of, of certain peoples uh, by by federal troops. Wounded Knee occurred in 1890, and the True Blue Saloon uh, we will encounter today. Uh, it's the name of, of a particular uh, bar uh, at which American sailors were assaulted uh, in the country of Chile, specifically uh, in Valparaiso, Chile, which is a major port along the, the, the Pacific coast of Chile. Um, and so I want us to consider the the ways in which the, the United States Army and Navy were envisioning uh, their future. We were already considering over the past several presentations the ways in which uh, the armed forces, especially certain elements of the officer corps, were anticipating great power conflict. And a fair degree of anxiety infused their, their beliefs. Now, historians don't have any radically or persuasively clear understanding of exactly why Americans of this age were so um, anxiety-ridden. But uh, at precisely the same time that there was tremendous optimism and confidence about, a, about prosperity and, and uh, increasing American productivity and, and its uh, concomitant uh, benefits for American power, uh, there were other Americans uh, who were deeply worried that the extension of American interests globally uh, would implicate the United States in traditional rivalries among the world's great powers and other regional aspirants for power, such as Japan. So as much opportunity as presented uh, the world at the end of the long 19th century, as it's often called, or the fin de siècle, um, it uh, provided an opportunity uh, and an urgent one for American strategists and thinkers, especially those in uniform, but not exclusively so when we consider Teddy Roosevelt or members of the Navy League, uh, to grapple with what this uncertain future really meant. And so that's the, the thrust of our presentation today. By way of navigating the images on, on slide one, uh, we see buttons um, for the ABCD uh, ships that had been uh, constructed in the 1880s, and these were seen as the first elements of the new steel navy, as it's often called. Uh, steel hull warships, uh, and you can get a sense that they were a blend of, of, uh, of traditional age of sail uh, and new steam technologies, with the rigging as well as the smokestacks. Uh, you can get a sense that the United States was undertaking to construct uh, what, were, what were, in many ways, uh, modern technological marvels. But if we take uh, that young officer William Sims's critiques uh, to heart, we'll appreciate that despite the fact the United States was modernizing, it was modernizing and building new ships without much understanding of exactly how to do it well. And and Sims and others would take the United States Navy to task internally uh, and forming an insurgency of sorts among junior officers to challenge the status quo, to challenge complacency, and to also challenge the new and to argue that simply because it's new doesn't mean it's good. How would you know, moreover, if you were a member of Congress? whether on the House Armed Services Committee or the House uh, Naval Affairs Committee or uh, just uh, a voting member of the Appropriations Committees. How would you know necessarily that what the Navy was presenting you uh, was either sensible or not? 
it's a real challenge to cultivate uh, defense expertise uh, in civilian legislative bodies and policy making bodies. The United States uh, was no exception in this era. If anything, it seems that Congress was more than willing to appropriate lots of money to build things, but was less concerned with the specifics of how well these things were made, how well they were trained and operated, and frankly, the, the internal dynamics of naval administration and the school systems that the Navy would create to, uh, to educate and, uh, and develop proficiency in operating these complex marvels. The image to the, the right depicts uh, uh, sort of a jack-in-the-box like character. You, you turn the, turn the, the hand crank uh, like a cotton gin perhaps and out pops this, this frightening monster. Uh, it, it's probably hard to see but the little diminutive fellow at the bottom uh, has, a, has a ribbon that says Egan. He was, the, uh, he was the American minister to Chile, which in this era the United States had very few embassies and so the senior ranking diplomat was not an ambassador, but a minister. This is not a, uh, a confessional uh, issue. This is not a, a faith-based issue. This is just the title. Yeah, he's not a religious man, uh, but he is an American diplomat named Egan. And in this particular case, Egan proves to be a uh, firebrand uh, and, and good fun in a lot of ways for the, the, the story will tell. Uh, but what you see there is the is the fellow who's popped up uh, with kind of a claw-like figure in a fierce visage uh, is about to swing a saber that says Chilean War Scare. If I were to tell you that in 1891-92 that the United States came very close to warring with the country of Chile and South America, you might be surprised. You might even be even more surprised if I were to tell you that odds are, had the United States declared war on Chile, it would have lost. We have to figure out how that happened. And so in many ways, I wish to shift our horizons beyond the boundaries of the continental United States, and also uh, far overseas, as elements of the U.S. Army were considering the possibilities of conflict. Let's turn to slide two. A key figure in what I would characterize as the Army's slow strategic reorientation it was a fellow named Arthur Wagner. And uh, Wagner was a scholar in many respects. Uh, he was a student of war. Uh, he would author uh, this particular study, The Campaign of Kunigratz, uh, which was an examination of the Austro-Prussian conflict, or basically what we would call the German Wars of Unification. In the, in the 1860s, in the precise time as the American Civil War, I might add. Uh, Wagner uh, would publish this volume uh, about two decades later in 1889. Uh, uh, he would also write uh, the very first American military uh, theory text, if you will, or the theory of, of war from an American perspective uh, called Organization and Tactics just a few years later in 1894. So Wagner is associated most often with this idea of officer education uh, and and not just about the, 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 the mechanics of how you might organize your forces but really to think through the processes of strategy formulation to harmonize policy, strategy, operations, and tactics and the ways in which force could perhaps be optimally used. Now, as a soldier, he was chiefly concerned with the affairs of land warfare. Uh, much of the United States Army was contented with thinking about the prospect of, of warfare in the future. Uh, in the era of Reconstruction and uh, Indian fighting on the frontier, as fairly much a domestic, continental uh, emphasis. In other words, if it were to fight, it would fight on the home turf of the continental United States. The army in this era, uh, or very few people, I should say, in the United States Army entertained the idea that the U.S. Army would be deployed uh, along the likes of the Mexican-American War, or perhaps uh, aboard ships to wage assaults on coastal fortress cities uh, that dotted the Confederacy's coastline. The army was by and large a land force and, and didn't think it was necessary to do much more. Wagner is one of the few individuals who really appreciated the possibility of great power conflict. And part of that, 
that study was uh, was a function of having uh, firsthand observation uh, of foreign militaries and their abilities. And we'll see a pattern here that uh, William Sims and the Navy and Wagner and many of his peers, Henry Halleck, uh, another fellow we'll talk about today, John Schofield and others uh, in this era were tasked by their respective military departments, the War Department, the Navy Department, with foreign military observation duties. These were accredited jobs. They didn't function as illicit spies or anything of that like. They were known to their companions. And in many of these foreign wars, such as the Sino-Japanese War or the Austro-Prussian War, the Franco-Prussian War, choose your favorite war, um, Americans were neutral in these conflicts, and so they had the, the ability to, to often to travel uh, to both sides of the warring lines, uh, make notes and observations, and report back home about the state of the art of warfare in other lands. And it was on this first, the basis of these first-hand observations that Wagner and others were able to make assessments of other countries' military abilities, and also you could say uh, mentalities that undergirded uh, military conscription, uh, the power that was uh, invested in certain countries' uh, military leaderships. And we should appreciate that in the United States, the tradition was that military thinkers, military officers uh, of, of even the highest rank were generally not considered very important in American society. They were often aristocrats, at least in the Navy, uh, and treated well in certain social circles. But beyond that, they were not necessarily particularly politically influential. And certainly at a broader societal level, very few people ever thought much about the United States Navy or Army. So this notion of a slow strategic reorientation is one that I'm making a case, an argument, that the United States Army, or at least elements within the Army, Wagner being one of them, uh, were arguing that in order to prepare for the possibilities of future war, that the United States Army needed to be more diligent and meticulous in its study of foreign conflicts of contemporaneous concern. So as much as the Civil War had recently uh, engulfed the United States, it was more tempting oftentimes to look at foreign military examples for shining uh, possibilities uh, rapid campaigns, decisive victories, and the like. And it so happens that the Germans, or the Prussians, uh, in, in these conflicts uh, unifying Germany in the 1860s and then in the 1870s with France, uh, was uh, a, a, a key demonstrator of, of amazing abilities, organizationally and on the battlefield, uh, the, what becomes Germany, uh, which was then called Prussia, uh, was a force to be reckoned with. Uh, it was industrial, uh, industrially organized, made good use of the rails, and, and a host of other uh, sort of, uh, it displayed a host of other uh, strategic inspirations that impressed American officers. Uh, so much so that Wagner actually, if you read the text here, and I encourage you to study it, uh, Wagner w was critical of this group of officers who were entranced, enchanted, if you will, uh, by European models of recent warfare. Not so much the Napoleonic, but uh, the ones of the mid-19th century. There is a small class among the professional soldiers in our country, he writes, who are wont to bestow all possible admiration upon the military operations in recent European wars, and this is where he gets critical, not because they were excellent, but because they were European. So he's making a case that the exoticism of foreign military example uh, obscured what the United States uh, in its American Civil War had actually accomplished in terms of developing military expertise. And so uh, he makes a, a critical point of, of elevating the professionalism of, of the American military institution. Now, Wagner's lament, in many ways, what that, was that this institution had largely atrophied in the immediate aftermath of the war. The structures had been dissolved and dismantled per American demands. That budgets be shrunk, the size of the military be, be shrunk, and that the, the, sometimes the, the enlistments of, of temporary soldiers to fight in uniform during the Civil War uh, were all expired. 
so they all went home. And so here, uh, at the end of the second paragraph, he would argue that the art of war had reached a higher development in America than it attained in Europe in 1866, and in some respects higher than it reached in 1870. So he's making a case that for all the in amazing things that Prussia was able to accomplish on the battlefields of Europe, that the United States had actually displayed far greater uh, abilities. And so uh, he does make a case, moreover, that Europeans had failed to learn much, if anything, from the American military experience, and had the Austrians, for example, uh, paid more attention to interior lines and to uh, the effective use of defensive uh, fortifications, such as uh, that were erected around, say, Petersburg or Fredericksburg or Vicksburg, that uh, they could have inflicted far, far more casualties on the Prussians and perhaps have actually won the war that they lost. So w Wagner is, is, uh, is, 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 a, is a mind, an intellect in this era. I will say that he graduated 40, uh, 40th out of 43 cadets at West Point in his graduating class. So he's kind of bottom of the barrel academically, uh, but nevertheless one of the few who, who shined. Um, and there's a host of individuals like this uh, historically who uh, did not perform particularly well at the military academies, but demonstrated uh, through the course of their career uh, that they were far more cerebral and far more capable uh, than those uh, class rosters suggested. Uh, but by comparison, uh, a class of, say, 40 to 45 officers was the extent of a graduating class uh, at the military academy in the, in the late 19th century. Uh, today, the numbers are somewhere in the realm of 900 cadets graduating from West Point on an annual basis. So you have some sense of the enlargement, dramatic enlargement, of the American military in the modern age in contrast to what it was in the 19th century. Let's turn to uh, slide three. And in, in continuation of, of Wagner's experience, let's focus on a fellow uh, named John Schofield. Schofield, uh, like Wagner, was a US Military Academy graduate. Uh, he graduated seventh out of a class of 52, so substantially better in terms of his academic performance uh, than, than, than Wagner. Uh, but his career stretched from 1853 to 1895, I mean, a lengthy, lengthy career. Uh, he was the recipient of a Medal of Honor and had served in the Civil War uh, and attained the rank of Major General. Uh, he would subsequently be the Secretary of War for uh, President Johnson and, um, and, and, and culminate in the final position as commanding general of the U.S. Army. So he had a very distinguished military career. Now, uh, nearer the end of this career, uh, he was sent on a uh, Secretary of War survey of France. He went to the Hawaiian Islands. He, he had traveled uh, a good portion of the world. And at West Point, he was a philosophy instructor, among other, uh, uh, among other topics, math and physics. Um, and and so in this regard, Schofield uh, demonstrated uh, a variety of abilities, but it's here uh, in a particular, uh, in his memoir, uh, where he emphasizes the Army's role in a number of important, uh, uh, in a number of important facets in American life. He makes uh, an argument in the upper left paragraph about this, uh, about coastal defense uh, and the atrophying uh, defenses of American forts designed to protect American ports, chiefly. Um, the wooden carriages had gone to decay, the guns lying on the ground. Um, and in essence, he's making a case that naval technology, especially with, uh, with, with metal-hulled warships, the ironclad fleet, he calls them, uh, were going to far outclass and outstrip American defenses uh, along uh, America's coast. He does make a, another case that the Navy, in the second paragraph, uh, was the uh, aggressive arm, the offensive arm of national military power. The first, not the first line of defense, the first line of offense. Um, so what's the point of the Army then? It's defense. It's a defensive reorientation or a defensive orientation for the purposes of the Army. Um, and he also speaks about wounded knee. Uh, in, in the paragraph to the right, 
um, and and made a case that a fellow named Nelson Miles, who would have a, a lengthy career in the United States Army, uh, in Indian Wars as well as in the Spanish-American War, uh, but he'd make a case that uh, basically this was a wounded knee was an accident, an accident, rather than by design. It was a mistake, uh, and that uh, that the Sioux uh, would 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 not pursue a general war uh, with uh, with the U.S. Army or with the United States government because of the, the, the negotiations of General Miles. Now, the Sioux had no general intention to go to war, he writes, if they could avoid it without starvation. So again, speaking to the problems of, of, of meeting the needs of, of Native Americans and, and fulfilling the treaty obligations uh, that the U.S. Uh, had established. Um, just by, by looking up there up at Schofield, of course, this wasn't an era when you could serve in uniform and have a beard down to your belly, um, uh, sort of pre-Special Forces uh, in, in, in its inspiration. If we turn to uh, slide four, uh, you see the cover of, of the particular book. He, he, uh, well, he finishes as a lieutenant general, uh, but 46 years in the Army should suggest a, a lengthy tenure. But his suggestions, moreover, uh, related to uh, related to those of of, of Teddy Roosevelt uh, and Mahan as well, uh, and he argues that uh, members of Congress should have military service. In my opinion, he writes in the upper left, no man is fit for a seat in Congress unless he has such had such an education as to be in in, in uniform. Um, Moreover, the first thing members of Congress should learn is the old and trite military maxim that the only way to carry on war economically is to make it, quote, short, sharp, and decisive. So how would you do that? Well, perhaps by winning a, an impressive battle like Austerlitz if you were Napoleon. You could hope that the results would be durable, or perhaps like the Prussians against the Austrians or against the French in those wars, middling wars of the 1860s, 1870s. But with regard to preparation, and that's a major, major theme, preparedness for war among those uh, like Wagner and Halleck, uh, Mahan, uh, and, uh, and, and here uh, to dole out military appropriations in driblets is to invite disaster and ultimate bankruptcy. Uh, no man is wise enough to tell when war will come. So this idea that if a hundred millions are necessary for adequate preparation for defense, uh, and you've spent only 50 when war comes, you might as well have thrown your 50 millions into the sea. And this is a demonstrable statement. There is no such thing as partial defense in modern war. Schofield is offering a powerful critique to, by, by this time, more than a century of American military tradition, which was comfortable with conscripting forces and generating troops uh, and raising and uh, the means of fighting once war began. Once war began. Uh, and, and he's saying that this is folly. Uh, and, and his peers in the Navy share this perspective. Um, he will also argue that, uh, that the United States ought to undertake something much like the Prussians had, which was universal military training. For, uh, for its male population, basically to put all men uh, into uh, some form of military service uh, and, and that they would drill as reservists uh, and be led by a smaller uh, full-time professional force. He thought that this was an ideal balance uh, to ensure that there was a, a sufficient pool, uh, a national pool, not just a, a, a small driblet of militia, but by and large, uh, that half the population would have received uh, military training and could be called on in time of big power war. And this is when, in the bottom sort of right paragraph block, uh, uh, Schofield is critical of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and the one lesson of reason and experience that I would impress upon my countrymen in every possible way is when war or insurrection comes or is threatened. So in other words, when the Civil Wars... Uh, occurring in 1860, uh, 61, uh, do not invoke judicial proceedings to, or call for 75,000 men as Lincoln did in his initial uh, call for volunteers to, to fight the Confederacy after the attack on Fort Sumter, but call for men as the emphasis here and let them come as many as they will 
and if the army was configured properly, it could accommodate this mass upsurge in people along the lines of the French levee en masse. So this is a bid for, for retooling the structure and the traditions and the temper of American life to incline it much more toward a military countenance, the likes of which the Prussians uh, had been doing and were held in high esteem in the ranks of the U.S. Army and Navy. Australian Navy. Uh, the bottom quotation, I think, really struck me as I was looking at Schofield some years ago for the first time, and foreign conquest and permanent occupation are not a part of the policy of this country. What a radically different world we inhabit today. And so one of the questions as historians that we ought to pose is, well, if that was the mentality, even though Schofield was arguing for a strategic reorientation to be prepared for great power war, he's arguing for defensive war not to go on the march overseas, not to seize other possessions or conquer anything else exterior to the continental United States. If that's the case, and if that was the, the norm in the 19th century, uh, how did it come about that the United States uh, has has become sort of habitually uh, entrenched in other lands? Uh, it's an open question uh, and one worthy of, of ongoing examination. So if you're Schofield, how do you win war? How do you win a war? Well, ideally, uh, the war would be short, and it could be won quickly by the use of overwhelming numbers of trained soldiers ready to go at a moment's notice, who were the beneficiaries of a large defense budget, able to fight and win. And he very much looked at the, the Prussian models of the 1860s and 70s as examples of doing just that. So what's the folly and the pain and the tragedy of the Civil War in Schofield's mind is that it was such a long and lengthy conflict. Why? Because neither side, the secessionists or the unionists, had really invested in adequate military preparation for the possibility of big war. Thus, it dragged out, it got bigger and bigger and bigger, but it was a bleary, bloody affair. Of course, Wagner would suggest that the Americans learned a few things along the way uh, and refined the art of war in so doing, but Schofield is critical. Let's turn to slide five. I'd like to introduce you to a figure named Emery Upton, another uh, Civil War veteran, uh, the author of several works, and, and perhaps this should be a theme that the visioneers, the thinkers, the intellectuals, the, the ones anticipating foreign war, uh, and, and c making comparisons about other countries' military abilities uh, were authors, authors in uniform. And so one of the ways they influenced their, their peers in, uh, in uniform, as well as uh, interested observers in military affairs, uh, was through writing. And in this case, Infantry Tactics Double and Single Rank uh, in 1875 was published by a commercial publisher. This was not published uh, by the likes of of, uh, of uh, the Army's uh, Command and General Staff College uh, or, or cavalry school such as the Campaign of Kunigratz by Wagner, uh, Upton pursued a commercial publisher. Nothing he's writing about is classified necessarily, um, but it suggests that, uh, that commercial publishers found military science uh, and art of, of profound importance uh, worthwhile of investigation. Now, Upton himself was a, a bit of a Civil War phenom. He had achieved uh, the rank of a brevet major general uh, and, and then re remained in uniform for a good many years after the Civil War. He ultimately uh, commits suicide in 1881 uh, and in that regard also follows in the, in the steps, uh, tragically, of Dennis Hart Mahan, uh, who apparently could not uh, adjust to retirement. Upton, by all accounts, might have had a brain tumor uh, and was exhibiting a variety of signs of neurosis and, and, and cognitive difficulties that were inexplicable. And so, um, and so there's some ideas that maybe uh, his mind was not quite right owing to medical maladies. Nevertheless, uh, Upton uh, had studied the Civil War 
uh, firsthand, and he would write about it, and he would basically develop his 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 recommendations of how to improve upon the fighting on uh, uh, infantry fighting on the battlefield, uh, making a case that the proficiency of soldiers uh, was vital to victory. So not just a conscript army of volunteers or part timers the likes of which Abraham Lincoln once was one uh, in a local militia back in the Black Hawk Wars. Um, he's making a case for, for bona fide professional soldiers who train and drill and understand how to use their weapons, follow orders, and understand the, the purposes for which they're fighting. Now let's turn to s slide six uh, and to get a sense of, of some of Upton's international experiences in the aftermath of the American Civil War. Um, and here I include the, the cover for his book that's published again by the same commercial publisher, Appleton and Company, uh, in 1878. Uh, but in 1877 he had been given orders from the Adjutant General, um, or, or uh, I'm sorry, uh, from the Secretary of War and from the Chief of Staff, uh, General Sherman, uh, to basically examine a variety of things. The Secretary of War had, had encouraged him to, to travel through Germany to, to, to pay attention to their schools for the instruction of officers in strategy, grand tactics, applied tactics, and the higher duties in the art of war, etc. Uh, Sherman said, hey, if you're going that far, go all the way to Asia before you come home. Uh, spend as much possible time as you can in Calcutta and in India. Uh, get familiar with British officers, learn how they do their, 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 their imperial duties uh, to govern 200 million people at the time. Notice how they quarter, feed, and maintain their men and transport them in peace and war. So all of these things are in, in, encapsulated in this volume. <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, uh, I mean actually all these books are online uh, through an organization called Hathi Trust and also through Google Books, most of them are. So if you're interested, you can pursue them uh, readily. Uh, and uh, it's a fascinating insight into um, contemporary military life in, in a, a number of countries. But having seen firsthand uh, the, the parallel developments in other industrializing and industrial nations. Uh, Upton became of the conviction that the United States was ever more woefully backwards. Mahan shared these perspectives also, and so Upton and, and Mahan are in many ways contemporaneous uh, commentators about the, the, the dereliction of duty at a national level that they believed that the U.S. government was failing uh, to provide uh, uh, its, its national security uh, for its people. It was failing to anticipate the threats of foreign military and, and their, 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 their changes in this age. So let's turn to slide seven, uh, uh, in which you see a cover for what's called the military policy of the United States. Upton's volume, um, which actually is, is ultimately printed, looks like this. Um, Uh, was was a volume that 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 circulated among uh, his officer peers in the ranks of the army, and he called it the, audaciously, uh, as Nelson would encourage, perhaps uh, the military policy of the United States. Was it the military policy? By no means. Uh, but this was his vision statement for what American national security should be, and this particular volume. Uh, he had drafted uh, in and around the time that he made this global tour. Uh, but he was convinced that the American people uh, were deceiving themselves. And so what he was arguing uh, was that there needed to be a fundamental strategic reformulation in, in how the United States thought about war, how it prepared for war, um, and he articulates some of the reasons. In the upper uh, uh, excerpt from the military policy, right, with the greater mass of people who have neither the time nor the inclination to study the requirements of military science, no error is more common than to mistake military resources for military strength. In other words, you could have 10,000 soldiers or 25,000 or perhaps a few new warships ABCD ships, for example, but perhaps those resources uh, were not well harnessed, used, developed, trained, maintained, uh, and fighting in fighting form. 
And so that idea that simple numbers meant something by way of power, uh, Upton is trying to challenge. He'd also argue in the second snippet, all of our wars have been prolonged for want of judicious and economical preparation. In other words, the American Revolution, the Mexican-American War, the Civil War, uh, had taken far longer than they ought to have uh, because the United States was not prepared for those conflicts. And he'd make a case that the, the cause of all of this is so is a obvious to the soldier and should be no less obvious to the statesman. So in other words, if you're in uniform, you, you should perceive these things. But if you were a civilian, perhaps you would not. Why had the United States not cared? Well, he'd argue that this legacy of fear of standing armies, of course, do you want a sitting army or a prostrate army? Uh, but <laughs> uh, since the days of, 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 of the, the British colonies, there had been, as we've discussed uh, some, some time ago in the course, this fear of, of a large military establishment as uh, a traditional um, source of, of insecurity uh, and, and tyranny. Now, this was a British uh, or English-speaking people's conviction. Army, large armies were a problem. They drained the budget, and the soldiers brutalized people and dominated politics. So he's making a case, though, that, that the reason Americans have been oblivious and, and actually opposed to preparation is that they've been overly fearful of a standing army. In, this, in treating this subject, he writes at the bottom of that middle paragraph, uh, I am aware that I tread on delicate ground and that every volunteer and militiaman uh, who has patriotically responded to the call of his country in the hour of danger may possibly regard himself as unjustly attacked. So Upton is not trying to undermine the, 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 the military ardor or passion or, or even the contributions of part-timers, but he wishes that America would wake up to the necessity as he feels is urgent to get ready for real war uh, and, and to need professionals who are prepared to do that. Uh, let's turn to slide eight and consider how close the United States and Chile came to war in 1891-92. And here we see a map of the, the, the Pacific coast of the Americas. Uh, to the right, you see two images of an American naval officer, uh, a fellow named Robley D. Evans. His nickname was Fightin' Bob. Um, and, and a couple other images that relate to the themes that I'd like to suggest. One of these is, is uh, the, 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 the drawing of a, of a Chilean warship called the Esmeralda. Actually, it was a British manufactured warship that the Chilean government purchased just outright on the open market. And here we see from the BBC in 2014, a report of Turkish protesters attacking American sailors who were uh, who were basically on shore leave in Istanbul. I've called this particular scandal the Baltimore Incident, uh, and that's often what it's referred to in history books. Although, if if it's in a book, it's usually a footnote. This particular uh, possibility of war is something I have to call a near war with Chile. Not quite, a, not quite a quasi war because there's really no fighting uh, between the actual armed forces of either country, uh, but it came very close to war, and so near war or Baltimore incident uh, are, are customarily the <clears throat> the names that we could attach to this uh, almost war. Now, in 1891, uh, Chile had undergone a, a civil war, and the, and there were two main factions: uh, the the president. Uh, and his supporters versus uh, members of Congress and their supporters. Uh, the members of Congress uh, were, uh, or the congressional faction, were seeking to overthrow basically an individual whom they believed was a dictator. And in order to uh, arm and equip their their insurrection, their their overthrow of their attempted overthrow and actually successful overthrow of the president. Uh, they even purchased guns on the open market uh, up in the United States. Uh, they, they sailed a ship up to San Francisco uh, and bought a cache of arms back when you could actually buy guns in San Francisco. Uh, and uh, and at this particular moment when the congressionalists were trying to uh, acquire the means to overthrow this dictator, Balmaceda was his name, 
uh, the United States government sort of belatedly and, 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 and spasmodically reacted, with, was, was afraid that American neutrality would be compromised if, if Chilean Civil War belligerents acquired guns from, from the United States. And so a U.S. Navy warship was tasked with trying to pursue and intercept this, this uh, ship laden with guns bound for Chile. It, it failed. Uh, but in its dogged pursuit, once it arrived in Chilean waters, uh, the Congressionalists, uh, when they were informed that the U.S. government had pursued them, uh, were, were rather incensed and angered that the United States government was, uh, was, was attempting to interfere in the outcome of a war they believed was just. So strike one for the reputation of the United States and of particular uh, the United States Navy in the esteem of the Congressionalists and their supporters. Now strike two comes about in part because of that fellow Egan uh, in, in the, of the initial slide that we looked at with the jack-in-the-box like uh, figure where Egan was, was, was a bit of a firebrand, uh, a trash talker, and, and some of the impolitic things he said about the Chileans and about the, the Congressionalists leaked uh, in the open press and helped to inflame Chilean public opinion, which was generally anti-President uh, anti Balmaceda. So it seemed that, that the United States government preferred the status quo in Chile. Why? Because it uh, its minister was in favor of the president, uh, and moreover, uh, the U.S. Navy was tasked with trying to prevent the Congressionalists from equipping themselves to overthrow the bum. So what we have there is, is you could say, strike two in the reputation of the United States <clears throat> and, its, and its, its emissaries in Chile. Well, at precisely this time, the American warship that was observing military operations off the coast of Chile in other words, the Congressionalists and the presidential faction slugging it out along the long coastline of Chile, uh, as were other ships of foreign registry too. Uh, apparently some German ships uh, and French and British were periodically observing uh, military operations during the Civil War. It was, it was routine, but the attention of the American ship uh, was what caught the, or, or the, the presence of the American warship called the Baltimore, caught the attention of the Congressionalists. They believed that the, this particular ship, the Baltimore, uh, was leaking uh, information to the president, uh, their foe, about the movement of congressionalist forces along the long coastline. Unaware of the, the, the depth of, of brewing hostility, perhaps blissfully unaware of it, uh, was, uh, was the commander of the Baltimore, a fellow named Winfield Scott Schley, who we already encountered uh, in his choice comments about the Greeley expedition. Well, Schley decided ultimately uh, in, in an act of, of profound stupidity, uh, I dare say, uh, to allow his sailors, or at least part of the ship's crew, to go on shore leave. To allow an authorized shore leave in the midst of a civil war seems, per, uh, seems uh, lunacy. I mean, you wouldn't wish to authorize shore leave in Syria, for example. Uh, but uh, and here you see the, the this attack on American sailors in Istanbul, which is a, is a far more uh, serene country in in a lot of ways than than perhaps Syria. But 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 Schley authorized his his sailors to go on leave. Uh, and where did they end up? Well, predictably, a bar. Uh, why a bar? Because sailors in this era were known for uh, inebriation and frequenting bars and, and bar life. Um, there was a, a, a violent reaction uh, among local Chileans who basically orchestrated an attack on the American sailors at the bar. What was the bar's name? The True Blue Saloon. And so at the True Blue Saloon, American sailors, several dozen of them, were roughed up, physically assaulted, and two of them killed. The local police, uh, the Chilean police, assisted, apparently, some of the, the, the brutality, uh, participating in the mob violence, and certainly not protecting uh, inebriated American sailors. Well, some of the stragglers made it back to the ship and reported to their commander what had occurred. 
Well, the commander corresponded with uh, the, the American minister, and collectively they wired back uh, to their superiors in Washington, D.C., to notify them of the, of the chaos and the death of two Americans. Schley, in his wiring back to Washington, uh, committed a major faux pas. If not the first, by allowing shore leave, the second was he basically lied. Uh, he said, my sailors weren't drunk. They were good and noble and respectable people. Well, no uh, self-respecting uh, Navy Department official or, or member of the executive branch could appreciate that uh, sailors on shore leave in this era wouldn't be drunk. And so Schley shot himself in the foot of his credibility, so to speak, um, by, by basically mas by misleading or trying to mislead the, 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 the events um, or, or, or mischaracterize the events. Schley's recalled as a result of his untrustworthiness and bad decision-making. The fellow who's tasked with replacing Schley and the Baltimore uh, was Robley Evans, depicted here, and he arrived aboard a particular warship called the Yorktown. Now, in the next few months, this crisis enlarged and, and radiated in, in, in intensity across the United States. American public opinion got more tenacious and more angry uh, as the press manipulated and toyed with American sentiments. Now, there's certainly nothing wrong with emphasizing the death of American sailors as a source of agitation and anger. But there were certainly calls for war and for, hum for teaching the Chilean a lesson, uh, demanding that Chileans uh, respect the power uh, of the United States. And so in this, this chorus of voices from Washington, D.C. to the West Coast, it seemed that the American people were inclined uh, to fight Chile, to, to force it to do what? To apologize. So we could call this an affair of honor. Does one have to fight for honor? Can one win? Well, most Americans were absolutely brimmingly confident that, that Chile uh, must be a backwards country economically, militarily. Uh, they considered it sort of the decrepit vestiges of the old Spanish Empire. And so most Americans, through, through uh, uninformed and, and racist lenses, described Chileans in all sorts of unsavory ways. But Americans were absolutely confident that should they be called to fight, they could destroy Chile. But they demanded an apology. And the chief problem with demanding an apology from the congressionalist faction that has now taken over the Chilean government was that no self-respecting congressionalist leader would ever apologize to the United States, or at least not under the threat of war. It was an affair of honor. And it was also a matter of consolidating Chilean popular politics behind the new congressionalist victory over the president. The Chilean congressionalists would not apologize to the Americans, would not be forced to bow to the Americans, uh, and frankly didn't feel the need um, to do so, especially when the American minister, this fellow Egan, was irresponsible. This fellow Schley, the other American naval, the American naval commander, was 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 a, a fool. They believed. So why would you apologize to fools? Well, fortunately, fortunately for all parties involved, including the United States, uh, Robley Evans, despite his nickname Fighting Bob, uh, was a very practical individual. You could call him a pragmatist. Now, Evans had, had earned his stripes and was a combat veteran of, of amphibious assault, actually in the Civil War. Uh, he was a seasoned, longtime naval officer. But very quickly, he took estimation of the situation in Valparaiso Harbor, where he lay at anchor. He recognized very quickly that the coastal guns that the Chileans f maintained in, their, in, in some of the local batteries uh, were of, of, of recent German manufacture. These were Krupp guns, uh, state-of-the-art. And if well-trained, uh, those crews could be directed uh, to blast apart his, his warship, which was a metal-hulled ship, but it was not armored with armored plate. And so he had a, a, a relatively newer warship, but it was highly vulnerable to state-of-the-art coastal batteries. Moreover, this Esmeralda ship, 
which I'd like to draw our attention toward, uh, was uh, was an example of, of Chilean investment in modern technology. Uh, Evans appreciated, and he'd write this ultimately in his memoir, that the Esmeralda individually could destroy and sink every single American warship, even if all the American warships scattered on distant stations throughout the world were gathered in one mighty armada. It had the firepower, it had the defensive capabilities, and it had the speed uh, to sink the entire American Navy. Evans appreciated this firsthand by, by uh, touring the ship. He tried to ingratiate himself with his Chilean hosts. He was careful not to, uh, to step on any toes. He, he wished to establish good, firm working relations with the Chileans. And, and, and Evans recognized that if war would to, were to come, he would die, simply put. And he wasn't uh, afraid of dying, necessarily. Uh, he figured if it's going to come, let bring it on. But he didn't want to die on account of miscommunication, that some accident would cause war. And so his estimations of, of Chilean defenses were some of the things that helped to, to moderate American national policy toward Chile. Fortunately, for all parties concerned, the Chilean government, after a few months uh, and tensions had subsided a bit, thanks in part to Evans's uh, diplomatic initiatives and, and confidence-building relationships, the Chileans were willing to apologize and to pay restitution to the families of the dead sailors. And so, if anything, the crisis resolved, the Chilean government made amends, and, and, and soon uh, this became a footnote. Let's turn to slide nine and, and look at some of the newspaper clippings that I uh, have uh, acquired out of various newspapers from 1891, uh, chiefly in October of 1891 from, from Chicago and Kentucky uh, and, and, and different uh, cities, but a deadly insult. Uh, Chile was often spelled different, Chile, Chile, like bowl of chili. Uh, the Valparaiso outrage was not due to mob violence. The suggestion was that this was a manufactured incident, a conspiracy to kill American sailors. And you can read uh, read these entries. One of them uh, it played around with the title uh, and called it Saucy Chili, suggesting that the Chileans were uh, fiery and playing with the food as well. Um, but here, uh, the United States was preparing for war, uh, but without a clear understanding of what the implications would be. Uh, it's, it, we learned subsequently that Evans's war warnings uh, were never really fully received. So the American people, for all their bluff and bluster and bellicosity, never appreciated, nor did the National Command Authority, in the form of the President, or the Department of Navy at this time, fully appreciate that the United States was preparing to march to war without the means to actually conduct it. Now, how would Schofield have felt? How would Mahan have felt? How would anybody have felt had the United States marched to war and then been witness to a horrific uh, battle at sea off the coast of Valparaiso and witnessed the death and destruction of the entire U.S. Navy? would have been difficult to transport an army without a navy. And so in that regard, let's turn to slide 10 uh, to see some of the other uh, statements. Uh, but there were eyewitness reports from American uh, sailors who were, 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 were survivors of this incident. Um, <clears throat> pretty ugly stuff. If, could you imagine the panic of being caught up in the midst of this uh, mob violence if you were a sailor? On slide 11, we see the images of those sailors. It took a while to find them, I might add. Uh, but here we see uh, Riggin and Turnbull um, killed uh, in Valparaiso. Um, the one fellow died instantly, and the other fellow uh, died of his wounds. Both of these sailors, I might add, uh, were, uh, were, were uh, accorded a, a unique um, a status. Uh, they, they laid in state in the Capitol building. So it seemed to the American people that this was uh, a, a moment of, of great opportunity to commemorate the dead and to valorize naval service in distant lands. So the efforts of people like Alfred Thayer Mahan in 1890 uh, to write uh, Influence of Sea Power Upon History had not yet fully radiated by any means within a year of the publication of that book. 
but in the 1880s, that naval renaissance idea and the increasing emphasis paid on American military activity and naval activity was starting to pay dividends in the rising esteem of the American armed forces within the American public. To give you a sense of the trajectory of this conflict, let's turn toward um, of, of slide 12, where Evans describes in A Sailor's Log his, his, his first memoir. He writes two, um, but but he would say, it is extraordinary to send a naval officer to find out the sentiment of the country, and I have a job in my hands. The responsibility of the position almost frightens me, he'd write in his diary. I could wire back a message tomorrow that would cause a declaration of war in 24 hours. So a more uh, bellicose sailor, less diplomatic, less tactful, uh, perhaps more audacious than Evans. Uh, might have perceived some of the, the antagonisms that Chileans directed in his, uh, in, 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 toward him uh, as, as, as necessitating war. But Evans time and again backed down for the sake of discretion and for the sake of survival and for the sake of maintaining American honor even though it didn't realize it was endangered. So the crisis resolves. Evans sails home. The American people were, were full of confidence that they had ba forced the Chileans to back down. It's not quite true. Uh, but nevertheless, the crisis abated. And as, as, as Evans returned and, and rose in increasing rank, uh, he was the initial commander of the Great White Fleet uh, and its global circumnavigation in the era of the President Roosevelt administration. Um, Evans's opinion of, of, of this critical moment of naval vulnerability is something that helps to accelerate the conviction of his peers in uniform and their supporters in Congress of the urgent necessity to improve the, the, the fighting capabilities of America's forces so that they would not be bested by a regional power such as Chile. Let's turn to slide 13 and in Schofield's memoir uh, he reveals a striking uh, dream that he had uh, about the way in which Chile uh, sort of metamorphoses uh, like a, into this um, splendid animal, as he called it, the noblest of his species, um, and the ways in which the Americans had tried to beat and, and force the Chileans to uh, capitulate, um, but nevertheless the Chileans remained firm and strong and more powerful than ever. We'll skip forward on slide 14, but, but you can read the, the elements of the Secretary of the Navy's report here to Congress. Uh, <clears throat> and I do pose this question, sort of, it's worthwhile contemplating as you read it. Could the forward presence, in other words, the advanced deployment of American ships, uh, such as under the command of Schley, uh, the Baltimore, be construed as aggravating? If you're present on the scene of, of hostilities, watching other countries go to war, uh, and, and an accident happens where your ship is attacked, or, or perhaps your sailors are implicated in some uh, internal dispute, um, what, what's the effect on American foreign policy? Most Americans didn't contemplate that, even those who were supporting this idea of expanding the Navy. Well, if you expand the Navy, you're going to send ships into difficult waters and into distant lands, uh, and, and who knows what will happen. So in other words, you might be at greater risk if you build this bigger fleet. Now in slide 15, uh, in, this, in, in, in Evans, Robley Evans' uh, second memoir called An Admiral's Log, uh, he reflects back on what a different uh, welcome he had in Valparaiso upon uh, his or uh, the Great White Fleet's arrival uh, in, uh, what was it, 1907, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but, uh, but he arrives in full strength, and what a difference between an individual and vulnerable American warship to steaming into Valparaiso uh, with the envy of, of the world's navies, uh, the most sophisticated ships afloat. And so Evans comments on that, and you can, you can read that. Now the final slide that I have is some of the ways in which this new institution established in 1884 would try and interpret the lessons of recent conflicts, whether the United States was a direct participant or just simply observing, such as war between uh, China and Russia, or I'm sorry, China and Japan, 
or any number of conflicts around the world, uh, American observers in Navy and Army uniform went abroad. The Naval War College was tasked with, with undertaking a lot of this initial gaming activity to rehearse on the big board, uh, literally there, uh, how you might play battleship. Uh, and to anticipate the movements and the requirements of modern industrial warfare. If your ships are going to steam away, where do they resupply? How do they get coal? How do they get fresh water? How do they get food? Uh, where are allied bases, or, or in this era, friendly bases uh, and, and port facilities? Uh, and, and questions such as this undergird uh, this transformation of American naval sensibilities to become a, a power projection force. How do you do it? How do you sustain your forces? How do you repair them if they're damaged? All of these ancillary questions, vital to the operational of efficiency of, of a fleet in time of war, or even individual ships in time of war, became part and parcel of increasing study uh, by officers in, in, in both services to try and appreciate what are the rudiments, the ingredients of waging industrial war. It's not just heroism. It's not just that you're ordered to fight. Uh, they don't expect necessarily to receive uh, volunteers or conscripts or militia necessarily instantaneously. So what are the professional forces that you have to fight at a moment's notice? How well trained are they? How familiar with, uh, with American strategic principles? How familiar are they with, with, uh, with interoperability? Uh, what are the doctrines upon which they will fight, such as uh, Nelson's band of brothers. How do they think of each other? Do they work well? Do they cohere? All of these are the concerns that are manifesting in the ranks of the United States Armed Forces at the end of the 19th century. Thanks for listening. Please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast wherever you get your podcasts. We would love to hear from you. You can email us at podcasts at c-span.org.